the greatest satisfaction that you get from your favorite food actually comes from the first bite. So if it's a chocolate that you're looking for, savor that first bite. And, and challenge yourself to hold that square of chocolate in your mouth for as long as you can because research does show that you get the most pleasure from the first bite of any food. That's a good little take home. And remember we talked about this, this sort of tribal society. You do need to learn the ability to say no. And I'm not saying you need to say no all the time. If you do that, you're adopting the all or nothing approach. You're only gonna be able to do it for four to 12 weeks. Your brain activity will change and it will gear you back towards those foods you've you've cut out we know that you see that heightened response of the, the reward system so you know the ability to stick to goals is influenced by others you need to be able to get yourself in an environment it's, uh, surround yourself by people that are supportive of your, or your of your journey your lifestyle and learn the ability to say no six out of seven days but not every day. You can still have your favorites, but they're the one to two times a week. They're not the everyday occurrence. Doctor's Kitchen, recipes, health, lifestyle. Nick, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, we've had some really good feedback on that pod as, um, as I hear that you have as well. Yeah, it's, it's been fabulous. Um, the response that I had from our initial chat, it was, you know, a great honor to be on your show. I'm, I'm very grateful to be back and it's it's good to be talking to you again from Sydney, Australia. So greetings, Dr. Yeah. Rufy. <laughs> yeah, we were just saying, so I'm, I'm meant to be in Sydney in uh, literally like three or four days now, uh, plus obviously the travel. Um, and we're, we were thinking about whether we could do this podcast in person. I, I really miss like sitting down opposite a colleague or a friend in this case and and just having like that one-on-one -on -one because there's only so much you can do via zoom but i mean we'll, we'll deal with it for, for now but i thought like rather than risk it because with everything going on right now with the variant and stuff uh, i thought we'll just we'll just get it in the can and then we can just go for a coffee if i do make it to australia yeah absolutely and some tim tams remember <laughs> yeah. which is very relevant with today's chat being food addiction <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it's a very good frame. Well, so why don't we um, we uh, provide a little bit of context to the listeners if they haven't listened to the initial podcast that we've done. So if you are listening to this for the first time, I would recommend you go back and listen to that episode. But uh, if you can't be bothered, uh, Nick, why don't you give us a, a brief overview of what we, we talked about with regards to uh, weight loss and, and some of your research as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we delved into why it's so hard to struggle or why it's so hard to succeed long term uh, with that weight loss you know attempt and it, it does come down to a couple of different reasons but we you know we jumped into the physiological responses to weight loss basically the minute you sign up to a diet um, or, or attempt to lose weight unfortunately your body's going to work against you and not with you it's going to go into shutdown mode um, and there will be, be this biological imperative to regain weight. So, you know, things like your metabolism lowering, uh, your appetite hormones changing, telling you to eat more, your thyroid function being suppressed, your adrenal glands pumping out more cortisol, all these things work against you. Uh, eventually the weight loss will plateau, but then worse still, it will start to climb back and you will regain that weight you lost. And this is the very reason why um, we are struggling uh, to succeed long term on our weight loss journey. Look, we all talk about the short term wins. There's no doubt that diets do help us with short term weight loss. Um, but what we're not addressing is that um, weight regain that we're experiencing. And that does happen sometimes within a few months, but definitely happens within a few years. Uh, and worse mm -hmm. still, you might actually do more damage than good in that you could drive up your set point uh, because your body gets very good at shutting down preparing for that next bout of starvation and putting on a little bit of extra fat. Um, and, you know, that's again, just because it's, it's in order to survive. It's left over from our time um, as, as, as hunter-gatherers and it's that evolutionary um, propensity to, to regain weight we've lost. So I do encourage you to go back and have a listen to that. Uh, it ties in nicely to today's one because when you look at the obesity epidemic, I mean, there are two main contributors. Obviously, the environment's hard. Food addiction um, and overcoming that addiction to our favourite foods, the processed and fast foods on every corner of every block, um, you know, that's, that's something that's a big struggle. Also, the fact that we use motor vehicles to get everywhere now from A to B, so we're not moving as much and we get poor sleep. Mm -hmm. So lifestyle's one, but then what happens is the waistline goes up 
and we have this reactionary response, and that is by diet through dieting, signing up to the to the latest fad or the new diet. Um, but what happens is, as I just discussed, and as we discussed in detail on that um, previous podcast, there is that biological imperative to regain the weight. You're up against your body, and it's very hard um, to to overcome that. But we did give some practical tips on, on long-term weight loss success, uh, talked about some of my science. But today's one, you know, if you think about this obesity epidemic, the problem didn't really come about until the sort of 1970s, 1980s. Mm. We did a very, very good job at uh, regulating our body weight and uh, keeping within a normal healthy weight range. Um, but then we did start to see this boom of the process and fast foods. Uh, and I guess, the regulation of our body weight is due to a very clever part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, now this part of the brain actually receives signals both centrally and peripherally but from various organs and tissues like your brain, uh, but also uh, other tissues in the body like your pancreas, your, your adipose tissue and, and your stomach. They release um, hormones which act on your brain telling you when and when you shouldn't eat. So for example, when you haven't eaten for a while, ghrelin will be released from your stomach, tells your brain to go and get some food. As you start to eat, other hormones are then released, like PYY, um, GLP-1, uh, telling you to terminate food consumption, to put down that food. So that, that clever wiring system between, um, say for example, our stomach and our brain work perfectly well, most of us mm -hmm. stayed within a healthy weight range. Um, but then we see this ex explosion of the modern day environment and the fast food on every corner. Now, the problem is the hypothalamus also receives inputs from reward circuits. Now, this is known as a hedonic pathway. Mm -hmm. It can actually override the homeostatic regulation um, of our body weight or the, the homeostatic um, system. And it's why we continue to eat even when our energy stores are full. And the very best example is the evening meal and dessert. So we've just finished our, um, our, our evening meal and out comes the dessert. And guess what? We can always manage to say yes. We can always fit it in even though our energy stores are full. So this is the hedonic pathway creeping in. It's making it very hard in the Monday environment to, to manage our weight because we keep saying yes to all of these favorite foods which are often low in nutrition, um, high in calories. So this is what we're going to jump into in today's um, in today's chat. And it's one of the you know big contributors to the obesity epidemic. We need to be able to overcome this 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 addiction to food and retrain our brain um, back to nature's treats. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's um, let's start off a couple of steps back actually, because I, I think. The concept of food addiction for a lot of people uh, hasn't really entered uh, the, their understanding. They, they haven't really come across this before. That. And I think intuitively people know that they have things like cravings, they have uh, you, you know, desires for certain foods. It might even be at certain times of the month or you know, in reaction to certain uh, elements as well. Uh, and also, aside from that, the, the concept of food addiction is almost quite controversial within the nutritional world. Some people believe in it, some people don't. I mean, I know which camp I'm in, um, but maybe we should talk about exactly what addiction means. So in the traditional sense, there are characterizations that we have using things like DSM criteria, ICD criteria, depending on which geographical location you are. And from my understanding, looking at substance abuse is a, is a good sort of comparative marker so to, to tell you know whether we actually are dealing with a true addiction and so when I think about addiction it's that that compulsion to seek and consume said substance whatever that substance might be and in that compulsion you lose that control that sort of feedback mechanism which would lead to overconsumption. and then in addition to that you have physical and emotional symptoms when you remove said substance as well. I mean, those are just three elements of addiction, and those are the things that come to mind. I mean, there's a whole long list of, of criteria that meets addiction. Um, looking at that criteria, can we, do you think we can compare those, those maladaptive patterns of behavior with specific elements of food, whether that be sugar, 
whether it be uh, certain types of, of foods that you find in you know convenience environments and and what's littered in our in our food environment w- w- how, how do we frame that that food addiction using that kind of context yeah personally um absolutely look uh it's it's pleasure-based habits um the hardest to break okay because these are enjoyable behaviors they prompt your brain to release dopamine okay mm-hmm. now whenever we're prompting our brain to release dopamine this is where we get into this um, addictive conversation and in this instance addiction to certain foods they release feel-good chemicals in the brain um, dopamine is that learning chemical uh, which basically means that next time we see that food our brain goes hey that was delicious last time go back for more so in the context of food yes because it's a it's a pleasure-based release that we're getting we're getting dopamine release um, and this is why it is so hard to overcome uh, that 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 sort of addiction to all these processed and fast foods on every corner of mm-hmm. every block so it can be put in the same category as as you know as drugs and, and alcohol um, and other forms of addiction. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, one of the other elements, which is uh, particularly important, I guess, as this uh, podcast is coming out in January, which is around the same time that you're going to see a flurry of diets and people trying to, you know, uh, make up for the overconsumption over Christmas. W- one thing that really comes to mind is this um, the concept of relapse. So, in a lot of substances of misuse, whether it be alcohol, whether it be cocaine, whether it be other uh, hard illegal substances, you find uh, some element of people trying to break the habit and they might be able to fight against those uh, neurobiological uh, pathways that they've built up and strengthened over time. And that period where they experience withdrawal can be extended, you know, seven days, 14 days, but then they have relapse. And so relapse is a really, really important uh, concept to get your head around, particularly around this time of year, because people sort of feel that if they can't stick with a diet, it's down to poor willpower, is actually what we're going to be talking about today, is how we've hardwired our system, and we also are fighting against evolutionary systems that push us in the direction of consuming so- certain types of foods, and, and some people are even more hardwired than others. We'll get into genetics a little bit later. Is that is that fair to say? Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Just as we have this evolutionary propensity to regain weight, um, it's it's the same with food. We sort um, out foods, we, you know, to that were high in energy, you know, best bang for buck, and that was in or- again in order to survive. So they were foods high in sugar and high in fat. Um, but they were naturally occurring in the environment. And nowadays, it's the high in fat, high in sugar foods, but they're the added fats, the added sugars from the process and fast foods. Uh, and you have them all the time, um, and eventually something's going to give. That is the waistline. But like you say, it's got, it's got nothing to do with that lack of willpower. Um, we are up against our biology. And the way to, to, to actually regain control of your health and weight I mean, to work with your body, not against it. And, and just as the problem is evolutionary, um, mm. so too is the solution. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, um, let's dive into some of the stuff that you were, you were talking about earlier, actually, in, in terms of that neurobiology. So the, the reward yeah. centers, and, and maybe we can also partition that out into the, the endocrinology that's going on. So the, the hormone base of, of how we uh, stimulate those reward centers that can lead to overconsumption. And, uh, and, and food addiction. So what's going on in our brain? When I, when I eat uh, a lovely croissant with uh, chocolate through it and cardamom and cinnamon, you can tell I'm pretty hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet. Uh, what, <laughs> what, what, is, what is going on? And, and, and how can we compare that sort of one uh, incidence of me consuming that, that croissant with perhaps, you know, a consistent eating of that nature that can drive uh, an, 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 a tolerance or addictive behavior. Yeah, okay, so I might try and address this in two different sections. I, first, mm. I, I guess firstly, it's, it's, it's delving a little bit more into our um, ancestral his, history. Uh, so remember, during our time as hunter galleries, as you just alluded to, food was hard to come by. Calories mm. were scarce. This is what people really need to understand because this is all about why it's so hard to succeed long term. We are up against our biology. So 
We therefore learnt to seek out foods that gave us best bang for buck. Uh, they were the foods high in energy, the ones that were palatable, um, and this was, as mentioned, in order to or needed in order to survive. Now, during our ancestors' time, these were foods that were found naturally in the environment. Okay, they were foods high in sugar, such as the fruits and the honey, um, but they're also foods that are high in fat, such as the meat and the nuts. So these foods also gave us pleasure. This is the important thing to note. Um, they would release those feel-good chemicals in the brain when we ate them, and they subsequently shaped our modern-day food choices. Um, but you fast forward a few thousand um, years and to the modern-day environment, I mean, now the story's very different. Of course, you know, we're still seeking out these pleasure-seeking foods, um, but now we get those highs from fast food Okay, the confectionaries, the, 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 the pizzas, uh, the soft drinks, and it's a far cry from those nature's treats we once saw. So we haven't evolved from these ancient survival circuits in the brain. And mm. it's what we refer to as this ev evolutionary mismatch, um, meaning that the evolved traits that were once advantageous uh, become harmful when placed in the Monday environment. So, you know, with food, we have these calorie-seeking brains. Um, they were this useful trait, but and that was when food was hard to come by. But now food is everywhere. We're submerged in this mundane environment, saturated with fast food, and we just can't control ourselves. Now, with respect to the physiology of the brain, I mean, the brain is an incredibly complex organ, organ okay? And it's, it is responsible for shaping our food choices and a particular part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the best way to visualise all of this in terms of what's going on is, is to think of it as a wiring system. Um, so this is wiring system within the brain. Now, the human brain actually contains neurons and it contains approximately 100 billion of them, so loads of them. Um, and each neuron in the brain actually has a long cable, several times thinner than a human hair called an axon. Now, this is where you actually get signals sent from one neuron traveling along to be received by other neurons. Now, these neurons also have synaptic connections. And they have up to 100,000 of these connections. Um, which are formed from other neurons. So you've got this sort of complex connectivity in the brain. Now these connections allow one neuron to communicate to another. And this is effectively referred to as the wiring of the brain. Now this is important to know because the good news is that this hard wiring of the brain is in fact soft wiring and it can be retrained. And this is how you can overcome that addiction to all of those fast and processed foods. Now we refer to this as uh, neuroplasticity of the brain. And, and what I'm saying by that is you can change the wiring of the brain. It does respond to new environments, uh, new situations and new lifestyles. So I guess that's sort of putting into context in, you know, we've got these ancient survival circuits. Um, let's work with them. Um, we sort of wired ourselves or hardwired ourselves to, to process some fast foods but that hard wiring is in fact soft wiring. We can retrain our brain back to nature's treats, which is what our ancestors used to seek out. So it's positive, you can do it, um, and you have to think of, of this complex wiring system as something that you can change over time. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really good way to sort of frame this because uh, I don't think people understand just how much wiring there is in, in your brain and how interconnected uh, all these different areas are. And when I, when I think about reward centers, whether we're looking at substances of misuse, whether it be things like cocaine or whether we're looking at something like sugar, um, you've got these, these neural networks that mediate all those sort of uh, reward centers that, that drive for consumption. And uh, putting it relatively um, sort of simplistically, you've got the dopaminergic drivers, so that dopamine, that pleasure, that pleasure uh, neurotransmitter. And you've also got serotonergic as well. Again, something that is driven and, and hardwired in us for, for pleasure th seeking. And then they connect through all these different areas in the brain, whether it's the amygdala, the sort of emotional center, whether it's uh, the midbrain, uh, whether it's uh, all the frontal cortex, you know, all these different areas. They, they are the, the primary areas, those drivers of, of, of pleasure that flow from all these different substances and so when you when you look at dopamine specifically uh that's been talked about a lot in sort of like popular press 
how, do, do we have any sort of understanding about how that directly compares with, uh, say, sugar and cocaine? I, I remember this headline a few years ago about sugar being as addictive as cocaine. Um, what, what, I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Is, is there is there enough evidence to suggest that they are comparable, or is that sort of just like popular neuroscience that you find in in the Daily Mail or some other paper? Maybe not the Daily Mail, but you know. Yeah, well, I guess when we're looking at the science, I mean, look, food that gives us pleasure is tasty. It's hard, therefore hard to resist. It's just like the high we get from having sex or listening to good music. We get that high from food. You know, we've mm. talked about we need to seek that food out. We're going to do it. Um, and it, we evolved to, to, to do so, and it's specifically food that's high in fat and sugar. Now, when we register a pleasure, endorphins are released simultaneously with dopamine into the brain's pleasure center called the nucleus um, acubens. I think I pronounced that right. Look, the brain then remembers this sense of satisfaction next time you see it, and it triggers a response. Mm. It's, it's almost as if your brain's been hijacked um, but that pleasure that was once derived from the fruits and the veggies, the, the honey, the nuts and the seeds, um, the nature's treats, well, it's, it's, it's no longer the case. We're getting that pleasure from the added sugar. Um, and, and yes, it, it's just as, as I guess, as, as potent um, uh, and as addictive as, as many of these other addictions that we have. We're getting that same release in the brain. This is why I remember these habits are so so hard to, to, to break and overcome because mm. we're releasing and we're dealing with dopamine. This is that learning chemical that triggers a response every time you see that food. And instead of being wired to those foods that used to occur or do occur naturally, we're just being relied, we're, we're relying on the heavily processed ones. Um, as mentioned, they're low in nutrition, high in calories. Um, they cause cravings when we see them. And as a result, they result in overconsumption due to a loss of control when we eat them. And that's when you can go and sit down, have the dessert, even though you've had the dinner, or you walk past the bakery store, you can smell, see, and taste that food from last time, and you want to go and buy something. So that added fat, um, sugar, and salt in those foods, they do trigger addictive-like eating behaviors, okay? And, and that's what we see in that modern-day obsession with so many foods, um, cakes, uh, the bakery treats, the pastries, the chocolates, the pastry, uh, pizza, the hamburgers, we all have our favourites. So, so yes, it, it's, 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 um, it's releasing dopamine and this is why it is such a huge problem in the Monday environment and why it's contributing to the obesity epidemic. It's a conversation that, that we need to have. People need to understand how our brain works so we can actually retrain our brain and go back to nature's treats, then we can regain control of our health and weight. And it's a key principle of, of that IW plan, IWL plan that we've talked about before when, when you're trying to lose weight long term. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting you say that about music and uh, things like sex and, and uh, all, all the sort of other pleasures. And that that is a really good way, I think, to uh, conceptualize this, at least in my brain anyway. So on one side of the spectrum, you have these highly, highly addictive substances that uh, not only release the dopamine and they impact all those other uh, reward centers, uh, but they, they try and, and, and reinforce that behavior as much as possible because there is such a significant impact. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things like maybe music or going to the gym very good like good behaviors and they, they uh, will light up those pleasure centers but they have less impact that would lead to uh, a spiraling negative impact on behavior leading to overconsumption within reason and then i think somewhere along that spectrum probably more towards substances of misuse looking at data over the last 10 years you have food in that category and particularly food that is overly processed and high in sugar that we know that impacts those reward centers and so that that sort of positive reinsure, uh, reinforcement via dopamine um it appears to to be w just one of those driving forces but i, I want to bring it slightly towards the sort of um the, the endocrinological aspect of this because we've been talking a lot about the brain uh, but mm. as you know from your research a lot of this uh rewarding behavior also is impacted by what goes on in your intestines and your stomach and those those hormones that are released. So you've got ghrelin and leptin 
Uh, those are the, the two classic hormones, but also PYY and, and uh, uh, insulin to an extent as well. How do those impact the brain? How, how, what, what happens there when, when I eat something in response to ghrelin being uh, produced? Or maybe we could talk a bit about what ghrelin leptin is, refresher for people, uh, and then how that might impact overconsumption as well, particularly when it comes to processed food and, and sugars. Yeah, this is a good point. Uh, ghrelin's a good one. A lot of us are familiar with ghrelin. I mean, when you get those hunger pangs, uh, ghrelin levels are going to be increased. They're going to be released from your stomach. They're acting on your brain. Uh, that clever part of the brain, remember, called the hypothalamus, telling you to eat more. So you go and reach for food. Now, unfortunately, uh, we tend to be reaching for more of those processed and packaged foods. But as we tend to, as we start to eat the food, remember, we do have a... Um, cascade of other hormones being released from various organs and tissues like the PYY, the GLP-1, the leptin, telling you to terminate food consumption. So th this is that clever wiring system that does exist um, to, to hopefully keep us within a healthy weight range, but that hedonic pathway keeps creeping in. It keeps overriding the homeostatic regulation of our body weight and we continue to eat even though our energy stores are full. So it's, it's like what we're doing is suppressing and nullifying this clever wiring system it doesn't mm. it's not working properly um, because these foods that are sort of cleverly engineered and manufactured in the modern day environment they just they keep yelling out to us and dopamine's released and we keep going back for more and more and more and we have a very hard time saying no so you're sort of suppressing that very clever wiring system that does exist between the organs and tissues and your brain telling you when and when you shouldn't eat um, so that, that's 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 a big part of the problem and also you know some of these hormones stop working as efficiently um, we know when you when you increase your adipose tissue um, leptin stops working as efficiently even though it's mm. produced in fat tissue adipose tissue um, it's not working as efficiently as it was when you're in a normal healthy weight range so there's a couple of different things going on there and then the other thing is um, which we've talked about previously too, is when you start to lose weight, this wiring system goes completely bananas. I mean, ghrelin levels go through the roof. Ghrelin levels go up telling you to eat more so that you regain that weight. And they tell you to keep, they stay elevated even after you've regained the weight so that you put on a little bit of extra weight. So you've got a sort of, yeah, a myriad of different things going on. Um, it's it's definitely making it very hard to to. Um, say no because it's, you're suppressing it and then you react, you sign up to a diet and then it stops working efficiently or works in the other way in that it tells you to continue to eat even though um, you're trying to lose weight. Yeah, I, I just want to anchor the listeners as well. Like, it sounds like really doom and gloom with what we're talking about here. Like, we're all we're all uh, uh, destined to, <laughs> to to continue overeat and uh, and eat and uh, you know we we lose control our, of our impulses. But we are going to get to some practical solutions a little bit later on in the show. Just just to remind people. Um, so so just to sort of clarify. So we have ghrelin that's released from the stomach and that has a positive impact on. Uh, food seeking behavior a lot of people don't realize that um, even though that is being released from the stomach and it leads to a whole cascade of of, of hormones uh, it's having that direct impact on dopamine and dopamine bodies in parts of the brain as well and the same thing can be said of leptin leptin being released from uh, fat cells and you've got pyy being released from the intestines these cascade again to inhibit dopamine so they inhibit the dopamine and thus reduce food seeking behavior and what can go out of whack is when you are on that diet when you are uh, overweight and you have like um, an imbalance of that system so you can see already you know we have addictive properties of the food itself you have the impact of uh, excess weight gain you have the impact of dieting as well so if you're doing a, a crash diet your, your body's going to be fighting against you, very similar to what we discussed last time on the pod as well. And you can already see this pattern of why you lose, quote unquote, willpower. And so if anyone's listening to this and it's, you know, January, you've been on a diet, hopefully this is giving you a bit more context as to why it's not, it's not your fault. It's the fault of your body and the fault of your food environment. And I think the, the food environment has a lot to play in, in this as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And even with the ghrelin, um, as you just alluded to, 
as we, we make those unhealthy food choices, um, you know, we're suppressing this, this clever wiring system, but we're also changing um, the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that's responsible for our lifestyle choices. So you know, it's made up of the gray and the white matter, but you actually you know, reduce the gray matter in that part of the brain as you continue to reach for the croissant, the can of Coke, the pizza, whatever it might be. But if you can retrain your brain to reach for more of the healthier food choices, you can increase that gray matter and it does make it easier over time. So it's definitely not all doom and gloom. And remember, it does come back to this neuroplasticity of the brain. Mm. Um, that, that, that soft wiring exists, you can retrain it um, and, and you can regain control of your food choices, your lifestyle choices, your health and your weight. Yeah, yeah. You, you can tell I'm really interested in this because uh, I, I looked at a couple of studies um, where they examined uh, dopamine receptors uh, in addicted patients uh, as well as in obese patients as well. And they found that the receptors for dopamine are found to be lower in addiction imaging studies. So what that means, just for the listener, is that if you have less receptors, you, meet, you need more dopamine hits to have the same desired effect. And what they found in obese subjects is the same patterns. You actually have a downgrading of dopamine receptors such that you need to have more of whatever substance it is that you, you are consuming for the dopamine hit to have the same effect, which again can just give a little bit more uh, understanding as to why we have these over-consuming behaviors. Is, is this something you've come across in, in perhaps uh, your clinic or in practical examples? Yeah, definitely. So remember what you're doing is you're actually suppressing this clever wiring system, you, you're stopping it from working efficiently. Um, it, it, you have that hard time saying no to your favorite foods and over time it stops working as efficiently. And as you just mentioned, um, it's harder to get that high. So you've got to have more of that food or those foods to get that high you're looking for, to get that dopamine release. And this is why it does, it, it, you know, can be categorized as that, that, that food addiction. It's very, very hard to overcome. And, and yeah, that's definitely taking place with our research studies. The other fabulous and fascinating um, thing is that these research studies where we sit down participants to different types of food and we use uh, an imaging technique called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we can measure the blood flow within the brain. Now, when we put these participants down in front of the process and packaged foods, you know, we see the heightened activity of the dopamine in the brain and all those feel good chemicals, uh, specifically in the prefrontal cortex. But interestingly, when we sit them down in front of the nature's treats and their favorite nature's treats, we also get that same response and heightened response in the brain. Mm -hmm. So we're also seeing the dopamine release, which is what we're after. And remember, it's all about retraining our brain back to those foods that we used to seek uh, and get pleasure from. No way. So, so you're saying that we can, we can have that positive reinforcement, that dopamine release in response to natural products. And I'm, I'm assuming it's things like, I don't know, uh, apples or barley or you know, greens or that kind of stuff. Is that is that? Am I getting that right? Absolutely, definitely. So remember, we want to rewire the brain back to healthy foods. We always sort these foods out. They gave us the pleasure and they were the ones our ancestors um, sought out. Now, foods that are naturally high in sugar and or fat give us the same high as the processed and packaged foods. This is what people really need to understand and appreciate because once you get that understanding, it's so much easier to retrain your brain back to those foods because think about it, the ones that are naturally high in sugar, the fruit, your favorite fruits, mm. um, you, you know, the ones that are high in fats, natural added fats, uh, not, not the added fats, the natural fats like your avocado, nuts and seeds, they make us feel good. But we just don't go to them as the default because we keep going back to the vending machine or the drive-through or the convenience store. If you surround yourself with those foods, and you remember how good they're going to make you feel, um, it's, it goes a long way to retraining your brain. So yes, you're exactly right. Those foods that are naturally high in sugar, the papaya, the berries, the nuts and the seeds and the avocados, well, they are high in sugar. They're high in fat um, and they give us the, that same high, the same dopamine hit in the brain that we get from processed and packaged foods. 
Oh, that's epic. I mean, you can tell like uh, it's summer where you are because you're talking about the exotic fruits and stuff that we have. And it's like the yes. middle of winter here, which uh, I haven't seen a papaya for months. So, um, But <laughs> just taking a step back, because I, I do want to talk about the practical applications of this knowledge and how you can form new habits and why habit forming is hard in itself. But um, let's just talk a little bit about the environment at large, because from my understanding, the reason why people fall into substance misuse, if we, we bring it back down to, um, to, to cocaine and, and, and other illicit substances, is not just a product of the, of the substance itself and its addictive properties, but it's also the environment in which we take said substances. So the impact of stress, the impact of depression, the impact of uh, environment, um, the, the lack of social cohesion. These are all things that compound that problem of substance misuse. We see it in America with the, the current epidemic uh, with, with opioids. We see it with people in the UK as well who are more likely to be in vulnerable circumstances that fall into that pattern of substance misuse. And you can draw a parallel with processed foods, unhealthy foods, and the same type of, of context as well. Is this something that you, you feel and you see compounds that problem? And, and what do you think the impact of stress is uh, at, at, a, at a neurobiological level? Um, yeah, look, I guess it also ties into the difficulty sticking to goals. I mean, it, it's highly influenced by others, isn't it? Um, you know, as a tribal society, people are made uncomfortable by those you know, breaking the mold um, and even though your decision to decline for example that that wine and cheese the afternoon gathering it's going to be difficult it's the decision um, you need to make and you need to be able to learn to say no so that you can see that um, retraining of the brain back towards um, nature's treats and, and see the healthier food choices become easier with time so uh, I think that's that's a big part of it. I mean, people that our 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 um, our company um, forms a big part. Our environment forms a big part, as you mentioned, into the food choices and the lifestyle choices we make. So it does come down to some of that um, identity accountability, being accountable for your actions, um, and putting yourself in environments um, to to make it easier to make those healthier food choices and lifestyle choices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I see certainly from a clinical perspective the impact of stress and overeating um, and the other sort of collection of psychological insults that can lead to someone having a negative relationship with food. And if you, if you look at that in the context of the food environment that a lot of people in financially underprivileged areas will, will find themselves in, those those convenient hyper palatable foods are, are abundant and it's you know it's 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 so hard to break out of that pattern right so so that's definitely got to be contributing to to the addictive properties of food itself yeah remember your brain likes habits they're efficient um and and when you automate common you know actions you free up mental resources for other tasks uh, and, and like you said, if sometimes we're just in the habit of, of going to that fast food outlet, it's, it's, it's a cheap, it's a quick option, and it's going to satisfy that need that we're looking for. And that's that dopamine hit. Um, so it, it's about breaking your usual routine and replacing an old habit with a new habit. And um, remember, these pleasure-based habits are the hardest to break because enjoyable behaviors prompt your brain to release dopamine. So... Mm look, you, you do need to be able to take accountability for, for your actions. You need to put yourself in new environments. You need to break old habits. To do that, um, you need to form new or replace an old habit with a new habit. So instead of driving that same way home via the fast food, um, you, you know, you do go a different way. Um, instead of breaking up your afternoon um, work day with, with the walk to the vending machine, you know, you encourage yourself to do something different, whether it's an exercise workout or, or just walking on a different route. But yes, it's about breaking down those those daily routines because we are creatures of habit. It's easy, frees up that mental space to allow us to focus on other things. Mm. Um, but we, we, we can still seek out that dopamine hit. Remember, it's easy to, to get that high 
we want to get that high. We're not saying, you know, that's that's something we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna neglect. We're going to satisfy that need, but we're gonna do it with nature's treats. So you've got to surround yourself mm. um, with those healthier foods, and over time, it does become an easier and easier decision to make. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, not to derail us totally here, I, but I'm I'm really interested if there are any gender differences in food behavior. I mean, certainly uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues have talked to, to me about carb craving, uh, about the impact of menstrual cycles, uh, the, the detrimental impact of fasting, actually. I've, I found a lot of, um, of my, uh, my colleagues have said that they've tried fasting, whether it be 5-2 or less than 500 uh, a day for an extended period and, and had negative impacts. I mean, is that something that you, you've looked into yourself, the, those gender differences? Yeah, well, I guess with respect to the other point you're making too, rem- remember when we cut out foods, mm. um, so it could be fasting or it could be going on a diet and cutting out your favourite foods. We've also got some fascinating res- research to show that after or anywhere between 4 to 12 weeks, we see this heightened response in the brain of the reward circuit. Your brain's basically saying, why have you cut these foods out? We need those foods in order to survive. Go and get more of those high sugar, high fat foods. So it makes it even harder. And then you go and end up having uh, to eat the whole packet of Tim Tams instead of just the one. So it, it, you're really, you're really um, you know, left in, in a situation where it's sort of that all or nothing um, and, and the what the hell effect um, creeps in. So. It, it, it's it's something to be definitely mindful of. Um, most people have really unrealistic expectations about the speed, the ease, the consequences of, of you know changing a behaviour. And, and habits, mm. remember, are a process. They're not an event. Um, and actual change actually takes time and, and effort and patience. Um, it's also not a linear process. You mentioned at the start that there will be times when you take a backward step. This is perfectly fine. Habits are all, all about this making progress um, over time. And remember, the best way to think of your brain when trying to form these new healthy habits um, is just to consider it like a muscle um, responding to training. If you train it repeatedly, it will strengthen over time. Um, coming back to your other point about gender differences, well, look, remember females are always, women are always the first to put up their hand when it comes to weight problems. Us men tend to do nothing about it until a serious health scare comes about. Um, we're lucky If we're lucky enough to survive that heart attack, we might then overhaul our lifestyle and do something about our health and weight. Women, yes, they're the ones out there having a really big struggle or have a really big challenge on their hands when it comes to food addiction because they're the ones going through this constant dieting cycle. They're the ones out there trying to do something about their weight. Um, but like we discussed, you suppress this appetite wiring system. You need more of that food to get the dopamine um, high that you're looking for. So, um, yeah, it's unfavorably biased towards towards women in terms of them having a harder time overcoming this addiction to process and fast food, only because they're out there and, and they're actively doing something about it. And and you mentioned. Um surrounding yourself with nature's treats right so I, i'm seeing this you know beautiful smorgasbord of uh, all these different uh, fruits and vegetables and and i mean i certainly sort of fit this category i've surrounded myself with nature's treats over the last 10 years since i had my health issues uh, and i'm grateful for the health issue that i had initially that actually led me down this path because it's retrained the way i see food so when i go to a restaurant i might enjoy an incredible uh, a platter of food that might have some fried items it might have some meat products it might have like some some beautiful searing or whatever but i also order the side of greens i'll also eat, order the seasonal vegetables because that gives me just as much pleasure as everything else do, do you have any other tips in terms of like how we retrain our mind to appreciate and to have that dopamine hit when we see a bowl of greens because i think for a lot of people this is completely outside of, of, uh, of, of how they see food and, and their struggles as well on a daily basis. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, look, cooking and, and food can be simple and you can great, create some wonderful flavors um, with, with home cooking. But remember, nature's treats, when they occur naturally in the environment, like the fruits and the nuts, they also taste wonderful and they also release that dopamine or give us that dopamine release as they are in their natural state. So 
most importantly, and, and the biggest take home um, tip should be that you surround yourself with these nature's treats. At your home, in your workplace, on your kitchen bench, um, whenever you feel something to eat, something you know that's, that's sweet or sh- uh, sugary um, or fatty, you'd need to tell yourself to reach for nature first. They're those four, we- four words, um, reach for nature first. So the fruits, the nuts, the honey, the avocado. Now, sometimes we think these foods are bad for us because they're carbs um, or they've been demonized by the dieting industry, but it is all nonsense. They're, they're ones we should be going to. You do get that same high from those foods and, and um, those nature's treats, remember, are lighting up that, that part of the brain. So surround yourself with those foods. Um, there's some other good things like, uh, you can be you know, implementing. Uh, remember the best or the greatest satisfaction that you get from your favorite food actually comes from the first bite. So if it's a chocolate that you're looking for, um, savor that first bite and, and challenge yourself to hold that square of chocolate in your mouth for as long as you can because research does show that you get the most pleasure from the first bite of any food. That's a good little take home um, mm. tip to try. Buy single serve uh, packages when it comes to, to your lollies and your chocolates and all of that processed food. It's easier to control the portion that you're gonna have and prevent you from eating the whole packet. Um, and remember we talked about this, this sort of tribal society. You do need to learn the ability to say no. And I'm not saying you need to say no all the time. If you do that, you're adopting the all or nothing approach. You're only gonna be able to do it for four to 12 weeks. Your brain activity will change and it will gear you back towards those foods you've, you've cut out. We know that, you see that heightened response of the, the reward system. So, you know, the ability to stick to goals is influenced by others. You need to be able to get yourself in an environment, surround yourself by people that are supportive of your, or your, of your journey, your lifestyle, and learn the ability to say no six out of seven days, but not every day. You can still have your favorites, you should still have your favorites, but they're the one to two times a week. They're not the everyday occurrence. The other big thing that we've noticed during COVID is when a lot more people have been at home, um, is are you hungry or just bored? Okay, often we go to that food environment um, to to look for something to get that dopamine hit. Mm. Okay, we're stressed, we're, we're bored. Um, so look, turn on the kettle, make a herbal tea, have a glass of water, because often it's just boredom, it's not actually hunger. And remove yourself from that usual environment that sort of um, prompts you to eat. So that can be in front of the TV, um, where you associate the TV with food, it could be in front of the computer. Change that evening routine, because that's the weakest time for most of us. We come home and we tend to eat most of our calories at the end of the day. We have it the whole wrong way around. Our body uses the calories far more efficiently in the morning, okay? We actually burn the calories two and a half times more efficiently in the morning compared to the evening time. Um, So bang up in the morning, reduce throughout the day, and evening should be the smallest uh, meal meal of the day, and change that evening routine, because remember, we're all about changing old habits, putting new habits and new routines in place. That, that's a really good tip. I, I, uh, I, I think the, the variation across the day in terms of when you partition fuel is, is really important for people to understand, it, I guess. And I think perhaps that's where the whole first meal of the day being the biggest kind of came from. And, and I guess it really depends on your environment and your convenience because, I mean, I, I skip breakfast uh, most days I think but when I say I skip breakfast I mean I just have my breakfast a little bit later on so typically it's not at seven or eight it's more like 10 or 11 but that that suits um, my sort of lifestyle when I'm working from home when I'm in clinic very different Uh, you know I'm trying to fit something in in the morning so I'm not starving throughout the whole day and then I can't eat until like 1 p.m. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different, I guess. And to, to go back into one of your points uh, about community and who you associate yourself with, your tribe is super important. And if there's anyone listening to this, I, I guess this is why CrossFit is so effective because you're, uh, when you're um, uh, working in 
when you're when you're within a group where the default option is to work out to train to eat a certain way it's no wonder that the desired effect is going to be going to the gym and, and being more consistent with your training which i think this is why like the crossfit community is just so um so switched on and, and and so impactful for a lot of people so finding a tribe where you have that desired health behavior is a, it is great and and like like you said earlier you know if you do fall off the wagon or you do have a, a blowout one day that doesn't mean that you've completely negated everything you've done up to that point just don't do it for two days in a row uh, and you'll get into that pattern of, of healthy eating bit by bit and I, I, one of the questions that i imagine people are going to be asking themselves at this point is okay i, I get that you know i surround myself with healthy food i'll try and find a group of people that are also doing this with me will make steady changes but how long is this going to take because we're fighting against a diet industry that is promising results in 30 days 60 days three months whatever they're promising short like amazing results in short term and, and we inherently love that i mean we're we're, we're humans we you know we want things instantly and we're, we're we're used to this instant gratification how long is this going to take uh, on average we do we want a quick fix don't we and and this yeah. is why <laughs> the dieting industry thrives. Um, we tend to go back to, to diets four to five times every year, and that's because we do lose, we regain, we, we think we failed due to a lack of willpower, but we actually failed um, due to our biology. Look, it's, it's, the habits take a lot longer to form than what we think, and particularly when it comes to um, these pleasure-based habits, remember the ones that prompt your brain to release dopamine, uh, we used to you know, talk about this magic sort of 21 days. It's far longer than that. Research does show that it takes 66 days, more than two months to automate a process or a new mm-hmm. habit. So yeah, it's far longer than we think. And look, it's not um, the same for everyone, um, but look, it's far longer than many of us um, think. And this is why you need to be able to Think of this as a process and not an event, which is what we were talking about before. It is, it's, a, it's a process that takes time. You are gonna have some backward steps, but as you just mentioned, if you, if you have a backward step one day, the next day you implement the good habit again and you keep focusing on those wins you're having and eventually those healthier food choices that we're making become easier and easier and easier. And you keep thinking of your brain and that wiring changing over time. When you start to hit that two month period, and you've been forming those good habits over time. It could be the daily walk. It could be reaching for the fruit instead of going to the, the, the vending machine of, a, of an afternoon. That will become the default. That will be the option that you don't even think about um, as, as, as the hard option. It's now become the healthy default option that you go to all the time. So yeah, you've got to stick to it for, for much longer than we think. I mean, yeah, we tend to do diets um, for the four, eight, 12 weeks. We cut out all of those favorite foods. Uh, those, those cravings for the foods that we did cut out come back with a vengeance because remember, we do have that heightened um, response to the limbic reward system. Habits are all about gradual changes over time. And I think very importantly, making sure that you actually replace an old habit with a new habit and even if you don't have people in your network that are supportive, an example might be I'm catching up with a friend and we're going for coffee. Now we sit down at the coffee shop. What tends to be accompanied with the coffee it could be a savory or a sweet food because we want to have a treat together. Instead of that, I could suggest that I catch up um, with my friend um, over a walk. We grab a takeaway coffee or whatever it might be and we go for a walk. So without actually talking, you know, um, uh, yeah, talking about those, those, those habits or having necessarily people around you that are supportive, you're rubbing off those good behaviours onto others and then that habit um, becomes ingrained into your, your catch-up. So I think rethink what you're doing with your day-to-day routine. There's so much room for improvement with everything that we do and that if you are breaking an old habit, just appreciate that it's not going to happen overnight. Okay, remember this 66 day number, it's gonna take more than a couple of months. There's gonna be a lot of backward steps, but eventually you will get there, that right wiring will change, the unhealthy choices will, will become the healthy food choices. Yeah, that, that really resonates with me because I've changed all my uh, meetings to walking meetings, uh, also because of uh, COVID risks and everything else. But 
Uh, I love a walking meeting. I think you just get so much more creative as well. Uh, and like you said, you're changing your environment such that instead of being in, in a closed space where you only have high sugar treats around you, you're actually putting yourself out in nature and you're getting some exercise. And the other thing you, you, you said about like uh, the speed at which this can, can happen, the speed at which we, we actually implement a habit change, I think it's super important. I mean, recently I, uh, I posted my, my morning routine. My morning routine looks like something from American Psycho. It's like, it's very regimented. I have 10 minutes of meditation. I wake up super early. I do stretching and exercise, I do my affirmations, I look at my vision board, I, I look at the schedule and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't do that like on day one. I implemented those things really, really slowly. I mean, I remember when I was started my meditation regime, I think I started meditating for like 60 seconds every day. That's how small it was. I'm like, I'm gonna meditate for 60 seconds every single day. I know I can achieve that no matter how busy I am, 60 seconds. And then that went to two minutes and five and then 10. And 10 for me is like my sweet spot, although I am thinking about increasing it a little bit more because there is some evidence about 14 minutes twice a day being you know, the ideal amount for meditation or whatever. Um, so my point is like you have to do these things very slowly and it has to be according to what is convenient for, you, for yourself. Definitely. So, you know, it, it could be just one habit you focus on and, and it could be that evening routine you know, I know I go home, my weakness time is turning on the TV and associating the TV with food. So how about I set that goal of four days a week, keeping the TV off and going outside, going for a walk or doing, learning a new hobby, helping the kids with the homework, whatever it might be, but disrupt that normal routine on X amount of days per week. So it's a realistic goal. Um, you can still enjoy some of your favorite routines but not as the everyday occurrence. And the same with, with many of the other habits. I mean, if you've got that vending machine that you go to every day, uh, set that goal of setting, uh, you know, surrounding yourself with the nature's treats and telling yourself to go for the nature's treats on five out of seven days. And eventually, as you're suggesting, it becomes easier and easier. You up the ante, you increase the amount of days, the amount of time, and that just becomes your new, good, positive, healthy habit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, it's about eight. It's just gone 8 p.m. your time. You're still in the university after hours. Uh, I can see the lights going on and off behind you. So I don't want to keep you too much longer, uh, mate. But this has been super, super fascinating. And I think it's going to be super impactful for a lot of people. Um, wh what are you up to going forward? I mean, you, you've still got the, uh, the program that's going really well. Uh, what do you see is on the horizon for uh, weight loss and weight maintenance uh, according to the research that you're doing and, and what you see on the horizon? Yeah, a lot of um, our work is, is improving the technology of the online program so that we can help people um, form these habits. Okay, remember food addiction is, is one part, piece of the puzzle. You've also got the sleep, um, the the types of food we should be eating, how to incorporate exercise. Yeah, so it's, it's improving that. So it's a scalable product that people can follow in the palm of their hand from all over the globe. Um, but also being able to educate our next generation. So our, a lot of our work now is, is working with parents, educating them on the principles um, of, of the IWL plan and setting themselves up so that they are surrounding their kids in these healthy lifestyle environments. Because this is what it's all about, making sure that our next generations are empowered so that they have control over their health and weight. Um, because otherwise, yeah, we, we, it's, it's not looking good. I mean, um, the obesity epidemic is, is unfortunately only getting worse in a lot of um, develop and developing countries. So yeah, a lot of my work now is, is on about educating parents and, and instilling that education into our next gener generation. Um, everything from, you know, the toddlers, children, adolescents, teenagers and, and later years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we didn't get on to, to talk about the, um, the intrauterine environment and how that significantly impacts a child's uh, risk and propensity toward obesity, diabetes and, and high cholesterol. So we'll probably have to park that for another time. Uh, I, I'm always getting asked about um, pediatric nutrition and 
you know, what things can you do for kids and, and creating a healthier generation uh, for the future. So we'll definitely have to chat about that at some other point. But um, but that, Nick, this has been that would be a great chat. Yeah, no, I think so. And hopefully if we're, you know, I am meant to be leaving for Australia in like three days. So uh, hopefully we do get to have that Tim Tam and, and coffee over a walk. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm but, looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, that'd be really fun. I'm really, really looking forward to that. But, but thank you once again for your time. And uh, I wish you success with the program. And uh, I'm sure we'll connect again on, on the podcast or in person. Yeah, thanks, Rupi. I re- very much appreciate you having me on. Um, keep up the great work. I'll continue to follow Yeah, everything that you do. So thank you. Thanks, bud.